Myland Mineland is an investigation into gold mining talents in the Western Australian desert. It is a critique of how imported colonial knowledge has obstructed Australia's ability to inhabit the land, resulting in its destruction. My speculative project is a settlement in Leonora, a gold mining town in Western Australia, composed of an archipelago of residential islands on the surface that extend into social, commercial and industrial space underground. It focuses on local resources and knowledge, remediation and the coexistence of different societies. At the core, it aims to reposition our relationship to the land as a fundamental driver for change. This starts by questioning how we value our land. The earth is the building block of our land and, in response to this year's brief, the earth has become my primary matter. My aim is to re-establish the ancient beneficial relationships between man and land by deconstructing colonial regimes and relearning indigenous worldviews to create a locally attuned settlement. The site consists of two townships, Gualia, a ghost town, and Leonora. In 1889, a London firm started mining in a place they had never been and transformed it forever. Herbert Hoover was appointed general manager and oversaw the town's development. He was patriotically American and mimicked what he longed for back home. His self-designed residence sits perched at the top of the mine like a castle on a hill. It's in complete contrast to its surroundings. It embodies the colonial capitalist mentality to conquer, silence, and domesticate the unknown with European sensibilities, and sets a precedent for the rest of Leonora. Between 1890 and 1980, towns were built to attract people to relocate and work. Boulevards abolish the non-human world, power poles replace trees, the urban grid encloses itself away from the land and replaces organic land formations with European order. In a series of campaign images from the 1960s, we can see how the oscillant idea of desirability is imposed upon the land. Water is extracted to maintain green lawns, sucking the life away from all that depends on it. Companies pay for everything, so economic efficiency is prioritised, accountability is deferred, and in this environment, aircon replaces responsible design. In an interview I conducted with a mining resident, he states, even with all three air conditionings running, the building would not cool down to a habitable temperature. The inefficiencies of the architecture dictates behaviours, imprisoning residents within their homes and decommunalizing people. We have to remember, this is a place that is so often being betrayed as wild, liberating and potent, it'll change the very nature of those who dare to venture into it. Yet people are systematically watering and mowing their lawns to maintain a civilised, European aesthetic. In its most extreme form, a second Britain was created in Australia. Its culture continues to dominate the Australian psyche, Common sense should supersede these traditions, yet they are prohibiting Australia from creating its own localised practices based on its unique climate. The desert was a label to describe a place that couldn't be occupied with European knowledge. All that is needed is a different kind of knowledge. Aboriginals developed sustainable land management practices over 60,000 years, yet they have been largely silenced and sidelined. The Dreamtime is a set of indigenous laws created with the sole objective to preserve the land in its primordial state. Indigenous ancestors come from within the earth. They shaped the land with their bodies and then they took their place within it in the forms of typological features. You and I might see a mountain and believe it to be a pile of rocks ready for extraction. However, indigenous might see the same mountain as a sacred deity, therefore unable to place a price on it. Tiny towns with a dark history when it comes to the displacement of Indigenous people. This story comes from Leonora. Those stones is what remains of a sacred site. We were given assurances a uh, hill would not be touched. One day we woke up and it was gone. I interviewed this man who helped me to understand that just by being on the land you learnt about it, connected with it and your ancestors and reaffirmed an obligation of stewardship. Indigenous were forced off their land and replaced with a group of people whose sole objective was economic gain, at any cost. When the Leonora mine closed in the 1970s, the town was abandoned overnight. When the mine reopened, people migrated back. This is evidence of a land that is only valued for its economic prosperity. Even if people wanted to call this place their home, it was dependent on a mining economy to function due to the costs associated with maintaining inefficient design. We must question how valuable is our land? Despite the differences of Indigenous and Western communities, the one factor that unites them is the land, and more importantly, how to survive it. During an early exercise, I attempt to portray the Leonora landscape two centuries apart. 
both timelines are overlaid to portray the complexity and convergence of parallel narratives. Australia's economy is dependent on mining. I looked at the process and asked if it could ever be sustainable. Improvements can be made, but they are still inconsequential compared to the damage mining causes. My project uses materials available on site to offset other types of extraction. I researched five different materials found in Leonora. This led me to eventually pick earth and spinifex. Waste earth, a byproduct of mining, can be remediated using spinifex through bioremediation. Spinifex has resin qualities. When combined with earth, it creates a material akin to concrete. Every year, a layer of waste soil is put back into the mine. The spinifex is planted to remediate the soil, and once complete, it is harvested to make the building material. This can become a commercialised product, creating a form of economy and remediating simultaneously. Inspired by the automation and remote control of the mining industry, I started to investigate how robots could be deployed to build and adapt the architecture or remediate. Here it is seen deploying microorganisms to aerate and populate the contaminated topsoil. Animals also became a field of investigation for adapting robots to be more innovative in specific environments. Like the thorny devil who buries himself within the sand, creating friction, directing water particles over his body into his mouth. We could harvest water in similar ways. VR assisted with understanding the scale of the project by allowing me to inhabit the space at a one-to-one -one scale. Bridging the gap between indigenous, natural and mining modes of living has been no easy assignment. I deformed traditional housing typologies, explored temporal structures such as inflatables, tested algorithms and conducted multiple massing studies above and below ground. Through these experiments I realised many of the problems I faced could be solved by nature. Bio-inspired design became a field of investigation, shifting my thinking from designing a building as an object to designing a system. For example, termite mounds. They are autonomous forms for regulating heat, humidity and airflow. Acting like a lung, their structure inhales and exhales as temperature rises and falls throughout the day. This circulates air continuously and pulls in oxygen while flushing out carbon dioxide. My design mimics these techniques and eradicates the need for air conditioning. I derived a method using a physics simulation in kangaroo to create a self-supporting canopy. A fluid simulation creates ribs that direct water off the mound to be harvested and the lines influence the network of paths below. I developed a growth simulation in Houdini to mimic the porous qualities of the mound. Although aesthetic, it wasn't successful. I eventually came up with a solution in Grasshopper that can be 3D printed, suggesting a construction methodology. Another example is the living stone which has developed a complex cell structure within its tissue that allows the retention of water and funnels light into its roots. This technique has been mimicked to create a highly efficient and diffuse skylight with low thermal loss. I created a simulation that changed the form creating an archive of skylights of different levels of refraction based on mass and angle. Different woven canopies are created during the dry season and hoisted around the mound, offering intricate shaded patterns. But the process of making them is also a time of sharing stories and passing down the knowledge of an ancient craft. Cato explained, indigenous moved around the land so they did not deplete a single resource or place. Their structures were abandoned, but as they were made out of raw material, they returned back to the land. The architecture will do the same, designed to return to the earth within a human generation. The earth that makes the mounds will be laced with dormant seeds, activated through the process of burning. This is a land management strategy indigenous have used for generations. The mounds will rewild and become part of the land. My project rebels against the grid and its inherent uniformity. The settlement's layout is an archipelago of islands composed of polycentric parts, each having the potential for a different city consciousness and identity. I tested different island arrangements. The position of the islands gravitate towards underground water networks. We can determine where they are by understanding and analysing the growth patterns in endemic trees. Rather than imposing roads, I use desire paths as a method for listening to the behaviours of place. Desire paths, or game trails, are a raw form of data mapping the human and animal tracks and avoidance of significant features like plant growth or dominant land formations. I predict human movement between islands through a generative swarm simulation and form paths based on this data. This draws a close to my portfolio film. In order to understand what it would be like to inhabit the architecture, please go and watch my cinematic film. 
It continues to explore time-based media using programs such as Unreal Engine to animate and simulation programs such as Maya and Houdini. The film explores the land and underground realm as a love letter played backwards, a hopeful, optimistic and resilient future for a once scorched earth.